In the sixties we had the height of realism. We have a reflection on the rationality of the state, the predominance of power, and strategic choices based on the rationality of the state. Strategic stability demands that you trust the rationality of the actor you are interacting with. In this, an actor doesn't attack because he doesn't see the benefit of attacking. The opponent is supposed to think the same way. However, in reality, we have the possibility that they could think differently. The problem is that, especially after the missile crisis, due to the fact that we had reached such a point of tension, it generated confidence in this risky idea. Once there is a difference of opinion, this makes the scenario more complex. The 70s, along with a whole set of criticisms, the realist thinking suffered, there was also a critique of strategic thinking based on these realistic premises which seek to focus on the decision-making process. By understanding the decision-making process, we can understand its complexity and the type of bargain we are proposing to place the world in that direction. In this, one of the seminal works in this discussion is the work of author Graham Allison in the book The Essence of Decision, in which he will try to use information about American and Soviet decision-making to analyze through different analytical models how the set of events materialize in that way, and the extent to which realists are right to be so confident that strategic rationality would necessarily lead to this kind of result that we observe at the end of the missile crisis. So he divided the analysis of that scenario into three models. The first model is the rational actor model. The rational actor model is the one the realist would use. For the realist, observing the crisis in in Cuba, he realizes that from the point of view of Soviet decision-making, it makes sense to send missiles to Cuba, because in view of Cuba's change in regime, the country offers the Soviet Union a strategic opportunity that Soviets could not lose. So it is rational from the point of view of power distribution, and from the point of view of decisively modifying the distribution of power, that the Soviets were willing to place their missiles on Cuban territory. From an American decision-making point of view, it would be rational to create a naval blockade. That's because doing nothing and letting the missiles arrive would give a show of weakness that would invite the Soviets to actually use these missiles. Attacking the Soviet convoy as it is heading towards Cuba would be an early declaration of war, which could effectively trigger the nuclear war you don't want to trigger. So the most rational decision is the naval blockade, since the problem with deterrence is that in this scenario no one has the capacity to take the initiative, the Soviets also need to be rational and not force a war. In this, as a result of what we call strategic stability, neither side wants war. The Soviets get what they want, they strategically position an ally to their advantage, shift the distribution of power and stage a show of wars. And Americans get what they want, since despite that, they maintain the scenario of stability in which no one is willing to start a war with unpredictable consequences and the cost of which they are unwilling to pay. So this is the realist reading of that scenario, in which, from a rational point of view and from a distribution of capabilities, this is what should be done. They avoid putting themselves in a position where they have no choice but to trigger nuclear conflict. We also have another model. It's an organizational policy model. It is the dynamics of organizations and the working protocols of organizations. Even as a decision maker, between you ordering something done and carrying out that process, we have a lot of steps, which we don't have direct control over most of them. Processes, protocols, tools that are already in installed in a certain place, which are decisive in the process of implementing a decision, are very important for us to understand exactly why a certain scenario happened and others didn't. For example, in the Cuban crisis, the Soviets had a missile distribution apparatus, which placed its missiles in strategic spaces in Eastern Europe. But having a protocol and equipment, a transport logistics for installing this material within Eastern Europe is one thing. When we had to install the materials in Cuba, the American satellite Light was able to notice ships embarking in Cuba. But on these boats, they start to unload material and install factories with tents with communist symbols that can be seen from afar. In Cuba, it made them more easily discovered. Once we have the crisis in place, the Americans need to decide how they are going to react to the blockade. Contrary to what appears within the American narrative, the naval blockade was the most reasonable alternative. The American decision-making process did not know which was the most reasonable 
of Senator. At that moment, we even had some who defended the air attack. Allison argues why air strikes were not chosen. It wasn't because it wasn't more rational or more realistic. The air strike was not chosen because time was too short. The Air Force had no protocol for training and operationalizing an air strike in the amount of time they had at their disposal. Since the Navy could respond more quickly, the naval blockade option became a more viable option than the air strike option. In other circumstances, there could be a very different result. In addition, we have another model, the government policy model. We saw the realist model, which doesn't look much into the state and infers all rationality based on the calculation of the distribution of power. The author pointed out the organizational policy model that observes bureaucracy. What happens between the moment the decision is made and the moment it is executed by the bureaucracy. But the author says that we should also look at political leaders who are actually operating as they play multiple political games simultaneously. Therefore, we have elements to be taken into account when making a decision like this, which are not necessarily linked to the distribution of power in the international system. It is related to the very stability of that political leadership and the political position he or she occupies at that moment. If we look at both Kennedy and Khrushchev, we have two very particular political leaders. Why does Khrushchev place missiles in Cuba? Among other things, it was because within the Soviet Communist Party, the failure to manage the issue of the air blockade of Berlin, which was in the year before the year of the missile crisis, left it in a political fragile position. He was afraid of being knocked down and he thought he needed a show of strength. Cuba offered him an international opportunity to rebalance the game with the Americans, an opportunity to demonstrate strength and stabilize his power within the Soviet bureaucracy. Kennedy had just come out of a failed military intervention, the attempt to invade Cuba with the Bay of Pigs invasion. So Kennedy is weakened in a context where we have elections in the US, where the Democrats were weakened. So this whole set of domestic elements creates a political circumstance that makes Kennedy not willing to take an absolute risk from the standpoint of his personality, but neither could he show weakness at that time. Given how the conflict ends, what does that show to us? It presents an accommodation between the difficulties faced by both Kennedy and the US and Khrushchev in the Soviet Union. How the crisis is resolved is a kind of agreement between the two. Cuba runs out of missiles, Soviet ships return. And the Americans, on the other hand, declare a commitment never to invade Cuba again, which is important to the Soviets because it allows the Soviets to demonstrate that they are in a position to protect their allies from the Americans. And they also make the Americans commit to withdrawing the missiles they had in Turkey that are within range of Soviet territory. Why is it important? It's a resolution that allows the two actors to communicate to the domestic audiences that they won the contest. Kennedy can go into the US and claim that he stopped the Soviets from advancing. Khrushchev can go into the Soviet Union and tell its bureaucracy that not only was he able to protect the Cubans, he was also able to extract concessions from the Americans that Stalin was unable to make. So in a sense, the outcome of that game can be read more from the point of view of how those leaders sell that outcome to their domestic audiences than from the point of view of how much it reflects the distribution of power in the international system. Ellison seeks to develop a reflection that proposes both a theoretical and analytical critique that realism is incapable of understanding the complexity of the decision process and how this process actually takes place. By failing to understand this, realism endorses strategies that are making the international system increasingly vulnerable to the incidents of an event that we cannot control and that will have unpredictable consequences. We have a theoretical critique and a political critique. There is a problem with endorsing the narrative that realism proposes for making policy choices when this degree of risk is involved. This marked a lot of the context of what we call strategic stability, in which we have the design of deterrence, which will generate a lot of strength after the Kennedy administration. That is all. Thank you for watching.